Hello there and welcome to the second part of the valuation course that is all about how to read an annual report or 10k and as well the quarterly report or 10q or it could be that you're just watching this video to understand how to read which is of course absolutely fine. Now in the previous video we saw where we can find these reports and if you're following the advice to value a company on your own then it is very likely that you already have downloaded the annual report and if you've opened it, then you're probably a bit afraid that it has too many pages and what the hell am I supposed to do with this? For example, for Levi's, 166 pages. For Upwork, 119. For Dropbox, 140. For Nike, 104. This is a thank you, a thank you so the quality report that we're going to take a look at later. Now, only because these reports are quite lengthy, that doesn't mean that everything that's in there is relevant. So the first part of this video will be a all about going through the structure of the reports and pointing out the sections that are more important than others. And I'll point out the sections where I spend most time to understand the company, the financials. And the second part of the video will be all about Nike as that is the company that I'll be valuing throughout this series. So let's get started. First of all, as you can see, the front page looks a bit different for all, although for Nike and Dropbox, it has this Form 10K written at the top. And that is actually what we're looking for. That is that is the, the first page of the filed report towards the Security and Exchange Commission. Um, the pages that are before that are just addition that the company thought it's, it might be useful to have, it's good to have, but it's even if we skip those, we would be able to get the same information from the pages that follow. So for example, if we take a look at Levi's, you see that it starts with A, so not the, a number of page in terms of a number. And if we keep scrolling a little bit, then eventually we end up at a page that has the same look. So with this form 10K written on the top, same goes for Upwork. Um, I'm going to scroll and here it is, right? So this is the this is really the first page of the report that has been filed. Now on the first page, there are a couple of information that are useful. Um, first of all is the period for which the report relates to, right? So this one, although it says Upwork 2021, it could be that the end of this fiscal year isn't the same with the calendar year. So for Upwork, that's not the case. It ends December 31st. For Levi's, as you can see, it ends November 28th. So this annual report is ending November 28th, not December 31st. For Dropbox, it is December 31st. For Nike, it is May 31st. So keep in mind that only because you have one annual report for a certain year doesn't mean it's the same as the calendar year. Now on this front page, as you can see, the structure is quite similar. Um, if you scroll a bit below, normally you can also find the number of shares outstanding. Um, for example, as of a certain period, for example, here, this one is as of January 20th. So after the report has been published, there were 98 million shares of class A, and 299 million class B. So what those mean, of course, is at some point later in the report, you can find more information about the rights of um, the shareholders of each class of different shares. If we take a look at Upwork, if we scroll a bit below, again, we can see down here that, let me see where it is, be down here somewhere. As of January 31st, so this is again a month after the, the, the fiscal year, there were 129 million shares outstanding. And outstanding is important because that is the shares that have been outstanding and opposed to um, shares that they are allowed to issue in the future. That's different, of course. If we take a look at Dropbox, if we scroll a bit below, again, we will find something similar. It might be a bit below here. It is as of February 15th, this is the number of shares outstanding. Uh, again, we have class A, there might be different classes against all of that comes with different um, rights. So that is actually the, the most important information that you can find on the front page. Now, if you scroll a bit below, you'll get to the table of contents. And this is, of course, something that if you're looking at for the first time might seem scary, especially because, you know, there are a lot of pages. But if you compare the, the table of contents, for example, you'll notice that they're actually quite similar. So they start with business, followed by risk factors and unresolved staff comments. 
So let's take a look at this one. Business, risk factors, unresolved stuff, comments. Properties, legal proceedings, mine safety disclosures. You'll notice that the structure is actually identical in, the, in this case, right? Let's take a look at Dropbox. If we go to the table of contents, business, risk factor, so it's exactly the same. The good part is that these reports are being structured in such a way that, of course, the companies have to follow this structure. So there is a some familiarity to it. If you've read a couple of them, then, of course, the one that follows, it's much easier to follow. You already know what kind of information to expect in each of these segments. Does it mean that all of these segments are relevant? I would argue that that's not the case. So I will leave Nike for last as I will be covering that in the second part of this video. And apologies up front that this video will probably be a bit longer, but that is the only way to extract the most value out of, out of this content. So which parts are the most important ones and what can you expect in each segment of this? The first one, and I'm going to mark this business, is this is one that is very important that I always go through. This is really where you can find information about the business, to understand how it makes money, is it selling products or services, um, maybe some information about its marketing strategy, about its manufacturing, if that's the case, or maybe outsourcing uh, of the manufacturing, the R&D. So this is really understanding the business and all of its operations, not through the lens of through the financial lens, so not through the numbers, but really to have a good grasp of what's actually happening. And if we scroll a bit below, so this business segment, Maybe we can do that for, for Levi's. Let's take a look at this part here. So let's take a look at something that, uh, so this is an overview of the business. You can see some of their brands, Levi's, Docker Signature. Um, you can take a look a little bit below some different segments that they have. Let's take a look at something that's maybe even more important. Here's the business strategy, what how they intend um, to continue leading the business. So brand-led. D2C, direct to customer first, consumer. They intend to diversify their, con their portfolio further. And brands and products, right? So this is really understanding what is it that they're doing. So there's some licensing as well. I'm not going to go through all of this information, of course, as it will be a very, very long video. Sales, distribution, and customers, stores, and e-commerce. So really, this first segment is normally one that's I'd say between 10, 20 pages long, but it is really important to go through it and as, as it really will help you understand the business. It is very difficult for me to make an entertainment video out of this content because it's pretty much a boring task to do. But the good part is if you know what to, which sections are more important than others, then you can at least speed this process up a little bit. Now, the second part, the risk factors, is the one that I rarely look at because in my opinion, even though um, from a rational point of view, it makes sense to be there, it's not really useful. Here's what I mean by that. Every company has to disclose the risks that the business uh, kind of is exposed to. But let's take a look at this, number 16, right? So let's take a look at the risk factors. I'm going to scroll a bit below and let's see if we can find something that's useful, right? So this is where it starts, number 16. For example, one of the disclosures, global economic conditions could have material adverse effects on the business, operating results and financial conditions. Of course, right? This is very logical. If there's something that has huge impact on the economic conditions, of course, Levi's business will be impacted. But not only that, these are oftentimes some broad risks, like political, economic and social instability. Of course, but how can we use that information? Like these are majority of the risks that you read in, in any of the annual report will be repeating in other annual reports as well. And I don't see the added value um, in going through that. Not only that, if you take a look at some of the disclosures, they're just, in my opinion, just, I don't know why, I don't understand why they are there. Like, what is the value added? Take a look at this. Extreme weather conditions. So if they're extreme weather conditions or Natural disasters such as earthquakes, hurricanes, wildfires, and tsunamis. They might hard, hard, harm the business. Of course. But what am I going to do with this information? And that is, this is the case for, I'd say, majority of the businesses, right? So a lot of these disclosures when it comes to the risk segment are 
I know that are mandatory to have by law, but I don't find that much of a useful use value. So this second part, risk factors, is something that I rarely look at. The next four parts, unresolved stuff, comments, properties, legal proceedings, and mind safety disclosures are, I'd say to some extent, useful, but as you can see, they're all one page. So unresolved stuff, comments, if there's something that's um, worth or there's something ongoing, properties, the properties that they own, legal proceedings, if there's anything there outstanding, and mine safety disclosure, this is something that, actually, this would be a good exercise. If you're not sure what this means, just Google mine safety disclosures, 10K, and then take a look at the the, um, the outcome that you get from Google. I think it's a, it's a simple exercise, and the answer would be quite understandable, and it's it's a simple question, but this is actually how you would go forward if you stumble upon something that doesn't make sense, right? So if we take a look at this, of course, it's, there isn't much. So from the first segment, of course, the business is the most important one. These are good to go through, right? So I'll mark these as well. So staff commons, properties, and legal proceedings. And the mind safety is something that you will probably, if you've Googled, then you'll know that uh, it's rarely that you'll stumble upon that. Now from the second part, the most important, or there are two sections that are most important. The first one is management's discussion and analysis of financial condition and results of operations. This is self-explanatory. The management provides its, um, its own kind of view of the financial conditions and how well the company did in the past. Keep in mind that, of course, they are not only employees, but as, as, as human beings, they also want to make sure that everything sounds well. So... Uh, go through this section, but make sure that you're not biased from what they say. Just try to have an open mind. And the last part that, in my opinion, is the most relevant one is the financial statements and supplementary data. So if you take a look at these couple of segments, right? So the first one is around 10 pages. It could be 20, depending on the company and the complexity around its business. Then this one is normally about one page, so not really that much time consuming. The next part, management's discussion, it could be 20, 30 pages. Sometimes it's just 10. So again, not that much. And then the most important part, it can be 50, 60, 70 pages. So although here it is 166 pages, it's actually more closer to, I'd say, 80, 90 pages. That's actually relevant. Um, if we go to Upwork, for example, completely different um, business, right? So here's the business again around 10 pages then we have again this section with unresolved staff comments properties legal proceedings again on the same page management's discussion going for roughly five pages so not really that long and then financial statements which is really the most important part so for upwork all of this would be closer to 40 50 pages um, to actually go through that are relevant for dropbox business so again we have these sections that are repeating so if you go through a couple of annual reports going through the next ones will be much easier right so if we take a look at the business again we have roughly 10 pages then all of these other topics that are relevant are on one page management discussion in this case it's close to 15 pages right maybe i'll mark these and the financial statements is the one that's by far the most complex one and the one that takes most time to go through and to analyze. Now, I hope that at this stage, you're at least familiar with, with the structure and the most important parts. At least that's what I look at. If you do this for the first time, it might make sense to go through everything just once and you can challenge right my selection. You, you might find something else that is more important or equally important, right? So if you want for just for an exercise, go through everything once, but I'm sure that that will not be an activity that you're going to enjoy. Um, maybe if you find a report that's a bit shorter in, 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 in length, it would be a bit better. Now, for this exercise, I'm going to go through Nike, but before that, as this is a video on how to read 10K and thank you, you'll notice that the thank you is much shorter, right? So this is for Upwork. So let's put them next to each other, right? So the annual report was 119 pages. This one is 96. And here you have a similar structure, right? So the front page, we have form instead of 10K. Now it's thank you. We have the period for which the report relates to. 
and as always we have the number of shares outstanding so this part is exactly the same and of course what we have next is the table of contents but the structure looks completely different right so if you take a look at this we don't have the standard part that explains the business and the risks and all that stuff oh we do have the risk down here but not at the very beginning um, there is nothing about the the explanation of the business because that's already being covered in in all the annual reports so the structure looks a bit different but we can still identify for example the financial statements part with basically everything that's down here that is comparable with financial statements and supplementary data so the order in which the data is presented is not the same but it is still there and then we have the management discussion, right? This is something that we saw that is available in the 10 case. So if you take a look, these are the two main sections over for the 10Q. Are th those are the most important ones. And oftentimes the level of details during the quarters is uh, much lower compared to the annual report. So that would be kind of an introduction for on the, on the structure of the annual and quarterly reports. And what I believe are the sections that will add most value now what i'm going to do is of course i'm going to go through nike's annual report and this is probably the part that will take a bit longer um, and if you want you can stop the video um, you can try to do this exercise on your own for the company that you chose to value or you can stay stay on the say watch the video see how i do it for nike and then try to um, do something similar. Now, what I normally want to do, and now I'm going to just open a simple Excel. I normally want to have somewhere, some place to take notes. As you know, uh, at the end of every valuation that I do, I have a, kind of a sh relatively short video of 20 minutes summarizing the, my entire process and the outcome. And this kind of note taking helps me to understand what are the most, Im most important Parts. Now for Nike, I have not read the annual report, so this is the first time that I'm reading it. It might be a bit slower than explaining the structure because that I'm, that's something that I'm familiar with, but now going through the information, I might need to pause, I might need to research a little bit, and of course this is the part that again takes a bit more time. But if you're interested to understand my process, then unfortunately this is what you have to go with and, and you have to struggle together with me, right? So right off the bat, I will note that this is so fiscal year and May 31st, 20 or May 31st, that's for every year. Try to zoom in a little bit. I hope that the quality will be good so you can follow right along, right? So the next parts for the shares outstanding, we are going to use that later on when we fill the template. Um, now here you'll notice that it looks a bit different, like here is the business, but they also have this split of the different parts of the business, right? So we have general product, sales and marketing, which is, I think, quite nice, but you get something similar in, in all the other companies as well. So I'm going to start with business and I'm going to try to understand what is it that, that we have here, right? So normally the first part is just... Um, it is relevant, but not really useful for the for the valuation exercise like when it was incorporated. So the first thing that I will mark as, as important is this part. Our principal business activity is the design, development and marketing and selling of footwear, apparel, equipment, accessories and services, right? So this is the mo why. It's important for a couple of reasons. First, you'll notice that manufacturing is not mentioned there, right? So we have design, development, and I'd say sales and marketing of, of, of and here I'll just note footwear, apparel, equipment, accessories, and services, right? So this is, I'm trying to do it kind of quick and dirty at this stage. And then later on, I can just add some more structure to it. So this is the business that they're involved in. So it's quite clear that the manufacturing is not um, something an activity that they perform. So they sell the products through direct operations, which are their own stores, so Nike only retail stores and sales, and of course online. 
but also to retail accounts, to a mix of independent distributors, licensees, and, and sales representatives. So um, at this moment, I will note a question. Can I get a split of sales that are done directly to consumers, so through their stores and online, versus versus sales through retail? This is important as, of course, if Nike sells the same products direct to consumers, they have better contribution. They, there's a higher portion of the revenue that remains at them. If they sell it through retail, then of course the retail party will get a small percentage um, and a lower part, of course, of the revenue remains by Nike. So of course that is something, it's not always uh, about having all the answers. Sometimes, as you can see, I'm just writing down questions and later on, Maybe I'll have I'll find the answers, maybe not. But it's good to at least have an idea. And this is at least how I think of, in this case, of Nike, right? Nearly all footwear and apparel products are manufactured outside the US, while equipment products are manufactured both in the US and abroad. Okay, so I would note, where are the products manufactured? So of course, outside of US, I mean, could be Canada, right? It could be Pakistan, it could be um, Indonesia, so it could be a lot of different countries. That doesn't answer the question. The reason why I want to understand this is that's where the risk is, right? If something is, for example, if that third country or if that country that has the manufacturing operations is Russia, the business risk is completely different, right? So I need to understand that as well. So, okay, so the fiscal year, of course, something we know. Um, okay, so nothing really too special here, just explanation of the products, which is something that I'm sure that many of you for Nike are familiar. I mean, it is, it is definitely a, a big brand. Um, nothing too crazy here, nothing too, um, too useful. Man and woman's apparel products currently lead in the sales their market leader, but maybe I could also find how it how Nike compares to Adidas, for example, in certain brands. Um, okay, so of course Converse is one of the brands that they own. So this, for example, is something that I would add at the beginning of my presentation if I want to present Nike to someone who has never heard of the company. I say, hey, well, this is this is what they sell, right? They they make. Uh, through third parties, these products, and the, here are the products that they're selling. So just as a as a kind of a short introduction. Sales and marketing. Um, so revenues in the first and four quarters are higher. I guess that's, is that logical? Probably around Christmas. And I don't know, I'm not sure what events are there to, but okay. Um, so markets, of course, yeah, this is something that we will see anyway later on because they all probably have a split of, of the revenue on the, on the different geographical markets. So they have a separate okay, operating segment for Converse. We'll take a look at that. Okay, before I move to the next page. So here, Okay, so majority of the revenues, at least, for, not majority, but 40% um, are within the US. I have 344 stores. So what exercise could be for me to take a look at the different, let's say the last five years, so the last five annual reports to see how this changed over time. So that might be something, so I'll note it down, maybe I'll do it. I mean, I don't want to spend too much to waste at least your time on this exercise that um, is fairly simple, but I'll note it down. So check how the US retail stores changes over time or how the number of retail stores changes over time. Hope that you can read this well enough. And I can move on with the next one, right? So, oh, same goes for um, the non US. So. How the number of I'd say how the number of store changes over time, U.S. and non-U.S. 
this this might be interesting because if I know the revenue, um, the total revenue, for example, or the revenue in the US, and I can divide that between uh, the number of stores that they have, I can have a good feeling of the revenue that they bring per store. But I need to be careful for the online sales as that's not part of the of any store. So it's there are some tricks here and there that that um, could be something that that uh, ruins our simple math calculation. So we need to be aware of that. So they have a branch offices and some subsidiaries in lots of countries and no customers accounted for 10% of more. This is actually very important. Um, for example, Foot Locker had huge exposure to Nike. And uh, of course that, that didn't end up well for them. So sometimes this might be, of course, a huge risk. For example, if Nike had 30% exposure to a certain company and suddenly there's something that went wrong there, of course that there's a risk um, that could harm the business. So normally this part, R&D, is, is quite broad. For example, we believe our R&D efforts are key factors. Okay. Yeah, so... What can I do with that information? Like it's just explanatory. It's so sometimes you have to filter through some information. Oh, here's manufacturing. So virtually all of our footwear and apparel products are manufactured outside. Tier mm, two. Wait, um, I would like to see a split or a con countries mentioned. So for fiscal 2022, which is the one that I'm looking at. Contract factories. So Vietnam, Indonesia, and China manufactured 44, 30, and 20% of the brand footwear. So this is an important information that I'm going to add. That is what I'm going to do. All right. So we have um, manufacturing Vietnam, Indonesia, and China is 44%, 30%, 20%. Right. So that is total. 94% is within these three countries. So if I'm looking at where's the risk, well, the risk is in Vietnam, Indonesia, and China. And of course, then there's the risk if, for example, the revenue declines, for example, in the US or in other parts of the world. But this is definitely something that's worth mentioning. Um, so the largest footwear contract, so they had one, one factory, 8%. Okay, so this first segment was for finished goods footwear, right? And the second part is for apparel. Here it's a bit different. So we have Vietnam, so maybe I can add that. So manufacturing footwear and apparel. Because here we have different countries, we could add Vietnam again is the first one. We have China and Cambodia. 26%, 20%, and 16%. And I assume that probably there was no other country. I think they need they have to disclose every country that's above 10%. So but that's still like 60 over 60% 60 is, is quite high exposure. So we already see some patterns of of um, where the manufacturing is done and of course Nike's operations. So International operations and trade. So this part, um, yeah, I think that's the, those are the most important parts. Nothing too um, too useful in that part. Yeah, competition. Like okay, yes, they have competition, but it's trademarks patents. Cupid. Okay, this one I can also skip for now. Culture, employee base. This one might be an interesting um, indicator. So, for example, getting the number of employees at the end of each year and see how that correlates with the revenue that it bring. So, does the revenue per um, employee increases? Although, um, in the, for the last years, it would be quite good um, as the inflation was relatively low. Probably in the next um, uh, in this year and the next year, it would be a bit more difficult to have a good comparison as it will be a bit distorted, very likely at least. Unless, of course, the company is able to grow both at the same pace, which is, I'd say, 
a bit unlikely. Compensations, benefits, COVID-19 response, um, I can skip all of this. Executive officers, this is something that, um, of course, you want to make sure that um, at least the top people are not ones that are already or, or oftentimes involved in scandals. Uh, ideally, you want somebody who has good integrity and not has not been mentioned in the news for, for poor um, performance in, in, in some field or just any scandal that uh, might ruin his or her reputation. This risk factors, as mentioned, is something that I'm, I have no intentions on going through. So it, I'm not sure how long it took, but we went through quite some, uh, I'd say maybe like 20 pages. And we have a couple of important points, right? So the fiscal year end, what is it that they do? I have some couple of questions and I have information of where the products are being manufactured. So that is already quite good. Now I'm going to take a look at, sometimes I take a look at the management discussion first and then the financial statement, sometimes it's the other way around. So let's take a look at discussion. Um, sometimes the first part is repeating and it has kind of similar information to what we had in, um, in, the, in, the, in the business segment. Sometimes there's something um, very more, more important and, and just or add some information to that section. Over the last several years, as we have executed, as we have executed, um, but I'm not sure. So this is purely for the Nike. This might be relevant, although this, as we know, that Nike was only one part. They had Converse as a separate part. So we're going to take a look at the direct to consumer, but this is something that I've anyway outlined as a question. So I'm not sure if this actually answers like 42%. We need to check that because 42% of Nike revenue is not Nike as a whole, but Nike, the Nike brand. Um, okay. So they had some changes in the leadership and operating model. Okay. So they had some changes like pre-tax. 294 million, which relate to employee termination costs and to a lesser extent, stock-based compensation expense. So this is interesting because in, in many cases, when there are these kind of restructuring expenses, um, of course, quite some companies had them in 2021, 2020, 2021 because of COVID. But we want to make sure that these are not expenses that were there in 2019, 2018. And because in that case, they're no longer unusual expenses, right? This one I'm going to skip. I don't think that's relevant for the future. Yeah, so the revenues, we're going to look at that in the next part. That's more for the financial statements. I'm sure that for all of this, um, there's actually a... So the, the, the overview, I'm not going to read through there because I think that this will be a bit more biased. So I'll go, I'm going to take a look at the numbers, the raw numbers myself later on. Non-gap financials. Um, yep, these are, yeah, return on invested capital. So looks quite impressive. Um, here's the change in. So. What we can see is already that the gross margin improved from 44.8 to 46%. And we need to see, and that's even from 43.4 the year before. So there's something here. And I find it interesting that these are the operating expenses, demand creation and operating overhead. This is something that these are I, very company specific. I believe that if we go back to Levi's and Dropbox, I don't think we will see Probably will be just the, the basic R&D, marketing, and sales and GNA. But we can we can take a look at that in a bit. So okay, so this is actually also quite quite good. Um, we can see how the revenue is being split between footwear, apparel, equipment. So footwear is. I mean, how much is that? We can quickly make a calculation, right? 29,143 divided by 44436. 
65 66% and then 13567 divided by 44436 so to be honest if i have to describe this company i would say it's apparel uh, footwear and apparel because that's 96% of everything that they make there's converse but i guess that also kind of to some to large extent fits within footwear so if when I describe this company, it would be footwear and apparel equipment. Sure, it, it is portion, but it's a very small one. Okay, so this is uh, this is part that I was I was looking for, and this actually explains to a large extent the improvement in the margin, right? Because you'll notice that the sales to wholesale customers has decreased. That is, those are the sales where they have lower margins. And the sales through Nike Direct has increased where they have higher margins. So that is already a, a good information that we can obtain at this stage. Sales to wholesale customers, right? Yeah. So not only that's, yeah, it, it's, that's already quite, quite useful. Man, woman, Nike. Okay, they, these are all, I'd say, significant. Um, okay, okay, that's, there's some useful information. This is also very useful. We could see also the, hmm, yeah, this is something that I already did calculate. So the, how it's being split. So for my presentation, I might just take this portion to explain uh, what's happening. And this part, 58, 42, that is what I would like to understand better, how that shifts over time. So I'll probably take a look at the annual report of 2021, 2020, 2019, to see how that changes. Do they... Uh, I, I can imagine that especially in 2020 and 2021, this increased significantly. And maybe there's something about the investors uh, in, the, in the investor presentation that they intend to, to improve that to a certain level, which of course would improve their margins. And this is important also. Um, we will see that later in the in the risk. So 41% North America. Then we have greater APLA, probably Asia Pacific and I guess Latin America. That's a weird way to group. What is that? I don't think where is the explanation? I've never seen any company to, to group these regions like that, but okay. I guess it's it's Asia Pacific and Latin America because those are the only regions that are not included. Uh, North America, we have China and EMEA, so so that is already quite quite useful. Gross margin, okay, we saw that. Yeah, so Nike Direct, of course. Okay, so they have also decrease in product costs, which wholesale equivalent, of course. So this is this is what I was looking for. I want to understand what is this demand creation. So it's it consists of advertising and promotion costs, including costs of endorsement contracts, complementary products, television, digital, and print. So actually, even though here it has demand creation expense, it's just purely sales and marketing, in my opinion. So I'm going to use just the sales and marketing um, description because it's something that's more explanatory compared to demand creation expense that. It sounds fancy, but yeah, if we take a look at the description, it's, it's quite clear what it is. Now we're going to take a look at these later on and how they change over time, especially in the valuation template. At this stage, what my intention is purely to understand the business, to, to have a good idea of what I'm looking at. And then when we move into the financials and then we go a bit deeper into the values, into the financial numbers over time, then that's where we can make better conclusions. Operating segments, yeah, Asia Pacific and Latin America, indeed. Um, yeah, so this is something that um, I would use, and I'll just make a note here. So this is page 39, so I'll just note here. Page 39, split of revenue per geographical regions. I'm, I'm using that for the weighted average cost of capital to some extent, so um, I, I will come back to this, to this part. This is the earnings before interest and taxes. So this is something that can be also used to, to see which region is the most profitable for them. Although 
it's a bit difficult to make those um, conclusions because there's of course other parts manufacturing related that are not in some regions so it might seem that uh, the, the earnings before interest and tax is somewhere higher and then they have for example so this was they have that for North America. Okay, so they have the split for every single um, region, starting from the one where it's, it's the highest to the lowest. Global brands, Converse. Okay, so it's good. It's good to know what what information is is there, and I think that is really the the most important part. So liquidity and capital resource. I'll go back to the. That's not something that I'm I'm really interested in. That's the first part. It was really. Now the financial statements and supplementary data is one where I'll probably spend majority of the time um, to, to really go through the data. And they always start in the same way. They always start with the financial statements. So in this case, as you can see, it's the consolidation, consolidated statement of income. It is for the last three years. So I have the revenues, how they changed over time, the gross profit, the demand creation, which is right, the marketing and, and, and sales, and we can see interest income and other income and expense right so this is purely it. now when i go through the template and and when i do a bit more deeper analysis i will go through these numbers as well this video is purely how to read the 10k so what what can you find in each segment so i'm not going to go into all the details and also i'm sure that this video is probably over 40 minutes long already so i will try to keep it under an hour if i manage that's great if not well, it is what it is, right? So we have the income statement. Then we have the comprehensive income. So there's some translation adjustments, cash flows, which you, I think for the purpose of our exercise, we can completely ignore. Then the balance sheet. So the balance of what the company owned and owed at this date. So the income statement is a statement of the profitability of the operations of the company for the whole period in this case it's for a year up until may 31st right so if you see here it says year ended but the balance sheet is as of a certain point it's, it's the same as for example if you as an individual right if you have a bank account and if someone asks you how much did you spend then it's referring to a certain period right so how much did you spend on food last month well it's for a month but if someone asks how much money do you have it's today at this moment. So that's kind of a differentiation between the, the reports. And here we can see all the assets that they own, how they compare to the year before, the liabilities and equity. And I will definitely go into a lot of details um, in the next video with together with the valuation template. Now, I'll mention it probably again, but um, for example, here, I will really focus on the numbers that are the biggest, right? So for example, um, if you take a look at this one, notes payable of 10, right? So what is 10? Well, it's in millions, so it's 10 million US dollars. Spending too much time on this 10 million, even though it might sound a lot, it's just a waste of time for a company that has a balance sheet of 40.3 billion. So make sure that when you're looking at these numbers, if at some point you want to understand it better, make sure that you're looking at numbers that actually will add a lot of value. For example, if you take a look at accrued liabilities, this isn't that descriptive, but it's 6 billion. Now, 6 billion is something that is quite material, I would say. So I would focus on that number before, of course, a 10 million, like 10 million, I would just completely ignore. Why, why should I spend any time on, on something that's 0 0.000? I don't know how many zeros are there before there's a certain number as a percentage of the balance sheet. Then there's the consolidated statement of cash flow, and I will go through it again. Um, in the valuation template, it always starts with the net income and then makes some adjustments. One that is, of course, always important is stock-based compensation. We're going to see how this changes over time. So there's a lot of volatility here, 2.4, 6.65. So I'll try to understand, of course, the profitability probably 2020 is likely because of COVID down. And then we have quite some bounce back, but then a bit of drop. So I want to understand that a bit better. What is actually causing that? The investing part. We're going to go through all of these in the next videos. It is going to... That one is also going to be a bit long. But 
of course, uh, I want to split the content so that it's, it's more digestible for you and you're not really stuck with too much information at one point. And then there's the shareholders equity. You can go through it. It's a bit more complex. And then there are so-called notes. So this is, this is the part that's always, um, I always find it useful. Sometimes you will find this overview. In most cases, I think it's, it won't be available. But basically everything that you've seen in the statements above, if it's not sufficiently explained, will be explained somewhere in the notes, right? So the first part, the summary, this one isn't the one that adds most value, but the ones below, depending on the value, might add value. So for example, here's the accrued liabilities. I'll definitely take a look into that one. Long-term debt, maybe we get some information about the interest on the debt that they have. And um, of course, the sections here are really, I wouldn't say all are equally important, but you need to find the ones that are more important. So the summary is really accounting wise, how they are the policies, the accounting policies behind. So I wouldn't spend too much time on that. Then you can see the PPE, the property, plant and equipment, how that changes over time. Did they expand or not? Um, for example, in the case of Nike, it's quite clear that the gross PPE, so it's um, this is before the, any depreciation, increased by 30 million. So probably they didn't increase the number of locations significantly. This is also not that significant to 300 million compared to, of course, the, the total balance sheet. Here's the accrued um, liabilities. So we have compensations and benefits. Okay, we have salary. So sorry, sales related reserves and allowance for expected loss on sale. Okay, I could follow that. I'm not sure what this other is still referred to no 20. Okay, that's for the expected. So this one, I wouldn't say that that's I understand it um, enough at this moment. So maybe there's something else that's below, but three and a half billion into other, that's quite, quite significant. Fair, fair value measurements, um, short-term borrowings. Hmm. 19.8% interest rate on non-interest bearing includes, okay, so this one is, Seems quite high, but this is, of course, yeah, this is ten, the 10 and the 2, so yeah, not that important. Here's, for example, the long-term debt um, the, as of each year and the percentages. So it's quite clear that the interest is, I would say, on average, around 3%. Because there's 2.25, there's 3.38, 3.63. So as part of the, the weighted average cost of capital, for me, I know already that it will be around 3%. I'm not going to wait it to get exactly the, the right percentage, but it's going to be around 3%. And it's quite clear from, uh, from this table that it, it will be around that. You can see also um, the scheduled mat maturity. So how much they need to repay in each year. But I mean, we have some for 2050, year 2050. Income taxes. Okay, yeah, income tax rate, of course, this is something that uh, will eventually it, it increases, it goes up to, I see, 25% on average, because you see for the US, it's only 21 and, and all of these that are currently, there, there are some benefits are there for a limited period of time, so we cannot count on those percentages forever. Um, deferred tax assets, um, I will also move in, take a look into this, so net we have 1.6 billion, which means 1 point is close to 1.7. That means that throughout, I would say in the next years, uh, they will have a deduction on their interest. And of course, part of that, uh, yeah, we don't know when the timing of that will be, but it will be 1.7 billion. So this 1.7 billion is not worth as much today, in my opinion, because it's not being discounted. It's just the total value. But if this 1.7 billion is, is used five years from now, I cannot value it at, at 1.7 billion. So we'll come back to that in, in the video again as well. And yeah, redeemable stock-based compensation. I'm definitely going to come back to this. The first part, the compensation is really the... So this first part, the expense is how much is there in the income statement based on the... Um, the contracts, the agreements that they have with the employees and the management. 
And that is, of course, reflected there. However, there will be something that's called like stock options that are outstanding. What this means is throughout time, right? So the stock that has been given to the management and I'm pleased, let's say last year or the year before, it doesn't mean that it has been exercised. And what, a, what an option is, maybe I should go a, a, little, bit, a little bit back. Um, the employees or the management are given the option to buy a share of Nike at a predetermined price for a certain period in the future. So you'll notice here that the weighted average expected life. So on average, they have six years to exercise this option. And each option actually has a value of around $90. So probably they can buy it very cheap, uh, maybe, I don't know, $5, $10 a share maybe for some. Uh, but probably it's most are, are, let me see if there's, probably there will be most at, at most recent price. I'm not sure what the price is now, but if, if it's 80, I'd say probably like 70, 60, 70. Um, there were 40.3 million options outstanding. Let me see. Uh, the weighted average option price was 68 per share. Okay. So they were able to buy a share at $68 a share. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, we'll go through this uh, in the next video in more, in more details. That's definitely interesting. There's still quite some options outstanding. Not, of course, as much as, as a lot of these growth companies today, but there is still something. So we will have to take that into account. Restricted stock and restricted units. Also relevant, earnings per share, I would skip that because I'm not valuing the company based on that. And I mean, I'm probably close to the end of the, of the report of a hundred pages. I guess that I would like to wrap the video. I would like to wrap the video around this segment because it's, it's getting quite, quite long. And as mentioned, this course will be a bit long, but you'll see that this process takes a bit of time and hopefully at least at this moment, you understand the different segments that are there on the, on the 10K the annual report. I'm saying 10K, 10K is the form that's for the US companies or for the companies that are not in the US or do not report to the Security and Exchange Commission. It's not called 10K, it's just an annual report or there are other forms that uh, have the name, but just 10K is the most famous one. So um, I would say go through the report and try to get yourself not to, to Nike's report, but the one that for the company that you'd like to value and familiarize yourself with these three particular segments, right? So if I go back, the business, the management discussion, the financial statements, of course, these I do not mention because they're just like one page and you won't see much there. So if we take a look at Nike, for example, let's see if there's anything there. So no unresolved stuff, comments, properties. It explains where their properties are, legal proceedings. There is nothing. We do not believe there are any material pending legal proceedings. So it really takes like 10 seconds to go through um, those, those segments as well. So I'm going to wrap this video now. I know that it's quite long. I hope that you get value out of it. Um, if you have any questions or comments, please let me know. And I'll see you in the next video where we're going to go through the valuation template and we're going to fill quite some numbers. Well, not actually quite some numbers, some of the numbers from this annual report into the valuation template. And I hope that you of course enjoyed it. And if you have any questions or comments, please let me know. I'll see you in the next one.